Welcome to Data Brew by Databricks with Denny and Brooke. The series allows us to explore various topics in the data and AI community. Whether we're talking about data engineering or data science, we will interview subject matter experts to dive deeper into these topics. In this season, we're going to focus on connected health and how data and AI augment and improve our daily health. And while we're at it, we're going to enjoy our morning brew. My name is Denny Lee. I'm a developer advocate at Databricks and one half of Data Brew. And hello, everyone. My name is Brooke Wenig, machine learning practice lead at Databricks and the other half of Databrew. And today, I'm thrilled to introduce Alexander Powell, who was head of quantitative analysis and development of the NBA team, the Charlotte Hornets. Welcome, Alexander. Thanks for having me, guys. So to kick it off, I would love to learn more about how did you get into the field of sports analytics? Yeah, so I, I was always into sports, played basketball at Kenyon College, um, kind of a small Division three school um, with, with a good academic program. And I kind of found there that I had this passion for math and numbers and stats. Um, but it never occurred to me that I could combine the two. Um, luckily, I had a professor who kind of showed me the way there, and that kind of led me to exploring kind of this quantitative field within sports that's kind of been really growing over the last decade or two. Um, so I kind of got my start in college just messing around with what I was playing in uh, and then kind of sh expanding that towards the NBA and other sports that kind of just interested me. And so obviously you're focused on analytics for basketball. But in terms of the evolution of sport analytics, what fields are most advanced? I think many of us have heard of Moneyball and analytics for baseball, but can you talk a little bit more about the evolution of analytics for professional sports teams in general? Yeah, so baseball was kind of the first noteworthy kind of use case, I guess. I mean, essentially the word analytics is more just kind of like problem solving through numbers in a way. And that's been done obviously since sports started, but from a much larger use it's in this century it kind of started with baseball reason being it's like this very discrete sport so it's a lot easier to like assign value to different events within the game where a sport like basketball or soccer it's very difficult because there's so much movement and so new technologies have allowed this shift to go from baseball to other sports being able to kind of increase it and also the cultures of the sports are so different that it becomes easier in some sports than others to kind of communicate those ideas to the people who've been doing it long before there were kind of advanced computing and machine learning within sports. Yeah, actually, I'd like to dive a little bit deeper into what you just said here, which is like, what were some of, in terms of the cultural differences between, let's just say, baseball and basketball that made it either harder or easier to help explain that concept of analytics to, in your case, basketball? Yeah, and I mean, I can't speak never worked in professional baseball. I have some friends that do, but I think that one, the kind of, they just had a head start with the kids. The simplest answer was because of how the sport was set up and basically most of the game was already collected from a, like a box score standpoint. If you look at an NBA box score, there's like so much missing. You kind of left like this isn't as helpful as it could be where in a baseball box score, you know, balls, strikes, kind of all of the events are recorded within there. Um, as well as I think there's so much more, the game is so slower paced, those conversations can happen within a game. So you can make those real time in game adjustments based on data where in a sport like basketball, we're not gonna stop the game to just, just talk to a player while he's dribbling up the court because by then the shot clock will go off. So we have to find other ways to communicate. Usually it's kind of like pre post game. We're slowly starting to get where we can do some things real, uh, somewhat real time. Um, we're almost more waiting for the data to slow down, to speed up. But then even a sport like soccer, like there's no way you're going to be able to communicate to a midfielder on the other side of the pitch because that communication barrier is just so difficult um, that you have to almost infuse it more into your scouting and your training than baseball can actually adjust things in the game. So you're telling me I can't do like Morse code or, you know, waving flags as a way to communicate to that you reason? try. And it's interesting to see how everyone communicates, but... Um, you know, a 24 second shot clock is, can be quite difficult to communicate exactly what you might want. And so, and last time I checked, I'm not allowed 50 timeouts, right. In basketball, right. Got it. That, that's fair. Okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. But then, okay. I mean, that actually leads generally into that idea of like, well, that because they're so different and it involves so many non-technical people, right. How do you share that insight? Like, you know, how do you get that information out to 
like like what type of insight are you even sharing and then because you did mention the fact that like it's often pre or post like for example are you sharing insight like you're recommending a player needs rest i'm just curious from that context so um, my focus is mostly on our on our front office side but within our group we a few of each of those components so we do have someone who will be with the coaching staff and in, in essence he's an assistant coach and most teams have a position like this now um, which is kind of the growth of the sport in the last five or so years is having someone who has that influence with game day decision making you know sometimes it might be within game and a timeout but a lot of times that's pre-game prep uh, we have a sports scientist who they're looking at data from a player rest or player load standpoint as well as a kind of how can we get these guys performing better? And then more my team's focus is how can we optimize our team, our roster construction, be it from scouting from the draft, the trades, free agency, um, to make our team better from that standpoint. So there's kind of internal focus with the sports science. You kind of have your day-to-day focus with your coaching staff group. And then our front office group is looking much more long-term projections of players. And so I know that the Charlotte Hornets are a small market team. Are there any challenges that are unique to small market teams that larger market teams wouldn't face when it comes to analytics? It's a good question. There's definitely like, I think our analysis has a little slightly different focus. Now I've obviously never worked in a larger market, but from our perspective, costs become much more of a, of a question um, because we don't have the same revenue streams that a larger market team may have. So, you know, I particularly try to infuse in all of our analysis on players or teams the financial component, uh, which I think a lot of times kind of like your, your armchair fan thinks it's like, well, just go get this player. But there's so many different nuances in terms of how you can get that player. Um, you know, one player may be better than another player, but the cost is different that, you know, you're almost looking at a value per cost of each player. Not that larger market teams don't do that. They certainly do. But I think for us, it becomes an even kind of larger importance. Um, you know, and I think also we have less tools because of that financial component of the small versus large market. We have less tools to kind of improve our team. So we have to find different nuggets, which I think is where analytics can really help small market organizations to kind of like the A's in money ball, where that was their advantage is we may not be able to pay players more, but we could maybe invest more in this area that will increase our team's value. Exactly. And I think a lot of those concepts also translate back over into the tech field. Uh, people aren't always about getting the highest salary. It's where do they have the most opportunity for growth or the way my previous boss had always framed it is everybody has a different form of currency. And so for some folks would be getting more play time, um, other folks could be living close to home. So it's, it's, that's a great point you make. It's not always about just paying the most amount of money to get a player. And so given that the Charlotte Hornets are part of the NBA, what exactly is the relationship like across all of the analytics within the NBA? Do you leverage any common data sources or data providers? What, what does that collaboration look like? Yeah, unlike a few sports, like we, we don't collaborate heavily. Um, we all know each other for the most part. We see each other at different events, but it's, it's less collaborative in terms of data sharing. Now, there are a few things like Second Spectrum, which is every arena, there's 12 cameras that sit in the rafters. Uh, they take 25 pictures a second of all the players and kind of can generate these like coordinates of the players on the ball. And we're able to use those. And so the league actually forms a deal with them. And so we all have access to that same data. Basically, we've all said, we agree to put the cameras in our arena. We can all get data from all 1,230 NBA games. Um, so that's kind of, the, for the most part, the extent of the sharing other than things like the combine um, where the whole league t- puts together. Uh, but other than that, it's kind of an, an arms race to s- who can use the data better. Got it. Well, then I guess that naturally segues into, well, I, I think I already know the answer and then the answer is no, but by the same token, I did want to ask the question anyways. Like, so is there an implication that you're trying to stream the data and you're trying to like, as the picture's coming in, you're trying to process and make decisions there, or is it less of that type of scenario, more of a batch analysis? I guess I want to, I, the, the high level question I'm trying to ask is like, is there an advantage of like streaming data within the context of basketball? I'm just curious. Certainly not as much as, a, as other sports, just because of those communication difficulties we talked about. Um, but we've really pushed over the last probably two years to get our data in real time for games. Um, that way, if our coaches do decide that there's something useful and we have found that like there's value, particularly, you know, you have, you only have 15 minutes to talk at halftime to your players, but if you can find a few nuggets that are communicable to your coaches or your team, 
you know, and even having that immediately post game, you know, the problem is the, the data latency from being able to get data from cameras, ingest it to second spectrum, then ingest it to us, clean it up and get it in a usable fashion is the latency is slowly getting to the speed where we could maybe use it in a timeout or between quarters. Um, but yes, we're slowly starting to real, real time. You know, we've been doing real time of our play by play box score stuff for years, but now kind of getting this really granular level data so that maybe there's one or two insights that can be communicated in these really short conversations that are happening between coaches. It's, it breaks. But, it, you know, I think that that's somewhat rare to, in the NBA right now. I think most teams are pretty comfortable just like, hey, we'll look at it the next morning or we'll look at it later tonight after the game. Um, but I think slowly this become, as the latency improves with the data, then it's becoming more advantageous to have on the bench. Oh, that's really cool. So it, it, that, good to know that actually even streaming is working in these scenarios. But then I guess that natural segue to my other question, which is like, what is right now at least common for all these teams that, you know, basically what they want to know, but they're not actually really currently getting from their data, you know, whether it's due to latency or due to analytics for that matter. I think the two big things that we've all kind of been asking for and when I say asking, it's we, we know it's probably not going to be done in-house, at least not at scale. The, there's data providers who, or league providers that we're hoping that can solve these problems is getting that same granular level data we have in the NBA in other leagues around the world, be it college or international leagues. So that when we're making these predictions, we can really kind of have like scale of, hey, this is what a guy did when he was 18 and here's what he's doing when he's 25. Can we extrapolate those? You know, right now, the the quality of you know, basically prospect data is is limited. Um, you know, I think we've done pretty well with it to date, but there's so many variables when you're evaluating a 16, 17, 18 year old that having that more granular data that's consistent across every league in the world is would be helpful. As well as I think the the next step, particularly, is kind of focus a little on the sports science and the player development realm as body pose information. So rather than having the X, Y coordinate for every player, could we have the locations of their arms or even a 3D map of their body to be able to know, hey, not only are you doing this with the ball, you're moving in this direction, your hands are this way. You know, I think the one of the smallest use cases is like coaches like to say, well, you were close to the shooter, but you didn't have your hand up. You didn't close out. From the data, I could say, oh, well, he contested it well in the sense that he was X number of feet away from the shot. But if we could say, well, yeah, he had his hand up and he blocked his vision this much or, or, or something to that effect, uh, we could we can measure kind of player development a little bit better as well as we could start understanding kind of like the biomechanics of players a, li a little bit more in terms of how they move pre or post injury um, and kind of help the performance aspect of the game. And how far out do you think that is? There's a couple of companies trying it now. We've tried a few things in house, actually. Um, I think it's a year or two away. We've we've been told that it, that that part is at least a year or two away. I think the getting the collegiate level data is is probably a little farther, um, but we'll make do. Every team kind of has their own little tricks to to get some of that signal out of the the noisy data we do have, and we'll continue doing that. And speaking of collegiate data, how are the analytics for college sports different than pro sports? They're they're pretty pretty different mostly just from a budget standpoint these teams don't have full-time you know people like me on staff um it's becoming a little more becoming a little more common for them to have people around the program so some places it's a volunteer some places it's a student a graduate assistant who also took stats as an undergrad or something um and there's a few companies kind of in the space trying to help out and assist with kind of this problem that college coaches have which is we now finally for the first time ever have data, but we don't have the skills or the, the manpower to, to handle it. We've actually partnered with, with Davidson on a few projects, but they have a great student led program where they help the, the coaching staff with like scouting and practice adjustments based on data collection. You know, and it's a bunch of stats and computer science majors who have basically said, we like basketball. We want to assist and help. And a lot of times those are great grounds for us to hire from or, or learn from even. Uh, and 
I think the big, the other big difficulty is we play 82 games. They play probably 30 usually. So the, the sample sizes are a lot smaller. So you have a slightly different aspect in terms of how you're going to look at and use that data. And with those games, how often uh, does the data team travel with the team so they can provide that insight at halftime um, or in between timeouts? Do you have to call up the coach? Do people actually travel for away games? On the NBA level, yeah. So we have, we have one guy who travels with the team full time. Um, I've been on a few trips, but it's more from a from an assistance perspective, not sitting on the bench. Um, but we have a guy whose job is to sit on the bench. We have another guy who's kind of back of house sports science, and so he helps with. We have chips the players will wear pregame and in practice to kind of measure load and in movements. So he kind of handles that aspect of player performance, and I'm usually back in Charlotte, kind of helping with the the analysis and the management of of the data. And can you talk a little bit more about the chips that they wear? Yeah. So each player has. We usually have them wear it on their on their shorts just because that's like center of mass. So there's a little pocket in the shorts where they can wear something on their waistband. But basically, it's just an accelerometer. Um, you know, you can buy an accelerometer for like ten bucks on on Amazon, but it's a little bit higher power than that. Um, but it can communicate to a laptop that will have sitting courtside. But basically, we measure all of those movements of a player, so you can kind of start to measure their loads, like how many times are they jumping. From a practice to practice standpoint, are you grabbing a ton of information out of it? Probably not, just because you practice so little in the NBA. But when you start to do that every single day of the year, and we're able to use, we're not allowed to wear them in games due to the CBA, but with the cameras, we're able to kind of estimate that information. But basically, if you can have an hour, a long sample of that, you can start to make assumptions in terms of when a player is tired. You know, should we work them more today or less today? Or, hey, it's a lot of times now that if, if, when there's good communication, the coaches can say, hey, I would like to, you know, I'd like to do a few more drills, but do you think our guys have the energy for it? You know, and I, it, it really helps particular health and performance staff who, who do a great job at kind of managing both like the art of player performance and, and health with the data and the quantitative part to really be able to measure what's happening on the court as well as the weight room in games, et cetera. I'm curious, does, does this actually help, potentially help with also when the player gets injured, right? To, to, to monitor them, to see how well they're healing themselves up. For sure. So we have we have a couple of tools. I mean, like so force plates are one thing that a lot of teams use where the players jump on these plates, they measure the force. You can start to see acceler- you know, their explosiveness, their deceleration. And so we'll, based on their like prior history, we can set these benchmarks for them to return to play and be able to to kind of establish how healthy they are and this is pretty common across sports actually i would say soccer is one of the the ones that is really good at that aspect of of player health because you can start to say hey sure we know what all all players are at but how can we personalize this information to you and your body to get you back when you're 100 percent healthy uh, not just when you might look healthy or, or say you feel healthy, but how's your body responding? Well, well then actually that, that really naturally segues to the, uh, this idea that as they're getting older, by the very definition, should their physical health be like not as good, <laughs> not as optimal, right? So are you seeing as you're recording over time, basically be able to adjust those thresholds or those benchmarks accordingly? So that you can, in, in essence, try to predict that you're going to, okay, you're two years older now, you're going to need to actually take a few more breaks or you can't, you you can't do as many free throws or you can't do as many three pointers because of that. I'm just curious if if it's gotten to that point yet. Just curious. Yeah. But I think a lot of it's more, this is where like, there's a lot of the art to the data science is having the people who can start to communicate as a guy gets, you know, when he's 18, maybe he doesn't need ice bath every day, but as he gets to be 25, you know, now you need to just because you've had all of these impacts on your body, you've played a couple hundred games. But being able to have a lot of people on staff who can have that communication and that, that relationship with players, with coaches, I think that helps to ease that curve and that kind of that impact on the players. I mean, how receptive are they to getting this these piece of, of advice or suggestions like, hey, you should really take a rest because our data says that you're overworked? Do the coaches typically listen? Do the players have pushback? Yeah. Now, luckily, I'm not usually the one having to communicate that. But, you know, I think the sport's grown a lot to where there's really open dialogue. And we do a good job of, like, sitting down throughout the year to make sure that there's those conversations so that when it gets to a tough moment, 
that that conversation is a lot easier. I think players understand because this is it's their help. You know, you have a lot of guys who they just want to play. Um, but if you can show them, you know, why things are important for them. And for us, like, we don't really pull guys out of games, but it's more of, hey, can you maybe get a little more sleep tonight? Or, hey, maybe we're not, we're not going to cut you off in practice today so that we can we can kind of manage their information. And honestly, this is the probably the the least kind of explored area of data science in sports right now. Um, so we're still learning, honestly, like we're, we're still collecting a lot of data in this area and hopefully within the next few years, we'll, we'll, it'll grow and players are starting to be even more accustomed to wearing a chip and doing all of these things that maybe 10 years ago, a player would have scoffed at because they never seen such a thing. Cool. Well then now let's switch gears a little bit because you did mention the fact that like, you know, you had reached out to college folks who potentially they'd be coming into the field of sports analytics. Let me just pose that question to you. Like, if you're interested in getting into the field of, uh, of field of uh, analytics, sports analytics, what's the hiring process like? It varies by team and situation, but typically during the year, it's really hard for teams to hire. So a lot of those hirings happen in the summer, postseason. Um, it's summer league is a big opportunity for teams because the season's ended. You kind of hit that down period where you can start to focus internally on on what you need or who's left or how you're growing. The Sloan Conference every March is a really good opportunity for teams or, or at least for students to, or, or people looking to move into the NBA to kind of share themselves. It's basically all of the, the nerds in the NBA go to MIT Sloan and there's a, a big conference every year. Um, you know, I think the biggest advice I would, I usually give is finding, anybody can say they know the math, the stats, the basketball, because it's a, a rare data science is a rare field where you not only have to know the science, but you also need to know the industry you're working in really well. And being able to show that you can do that be some, be, via some portfolio of work, be it a, some blog posts that are a way to show what you can do or just a portfolio you can share with teams or employers um, really kind of can help you not just say that you can do the work, but show a team that, hey, this person knows how to do what they do, what they say they do. And so do you typically see people go into this field of sports analytics directly from college? Do you see them go in from other industries, like they worked as an engineer, data scientist elsewhere, and then they transition? What's typically the career path like? I think it really varies. I, I know people who work in analytics in the MBA who were in investment banking, who were in data science jobs previously, some who kind of learned the analytics aspects while in the NBA, they, they saw it as a growing field and, hey, this is something I'd like to do. Um, so I think it really varies. There's a lot of people who enter as interns and those internships roll into regular jobs. The NBA uses interns pretty heavily, um, not as a go grab me coffee, but just particularly like the summertime, there's a lot to be done uh, and a, kind of a lot of untapped things that, you know, someone who's an intern or working in college can do. And so we worked with college students even during their school year to say, hey, you have this project for school. Um, you know, your professor has recommended you, you know, and we think it would add a value to, for us as well, as well as kind of get to know you. And I've got to ask, I know with baseball, they use the term sabermetrics. Is there any equivalent term for using data for the NBA or for basketball? Uh, not really. I think people have tried to coin a few terms and just none of them stuck. Um, they they. They didn't form like actual words, which was the part. They were more acronyms. Um, but typically we say analytics, which I think is almost like a misnomer of, because it's not like you have to be able to program and do all this stuff to analyze something. Uh, but it's basically we've called it anal analytics. Even if someone's a developer or if they're an actual analyst, it's all kind of grouped into analysts. You know, and, and a lot of times it's if you were in an, an analytics group, it's you're the person who knows technology the best. So you end up also doing a, a little of everything, but um, it gives us good opportunities. So. Got to So you're the IT shop as well. <laughs> what you're saying? <laughs> not fully. I'm glad I'm not. We have a good IT person, but you know, you do end up assisting in a lot of ways that, that you didn't expect to, but it kind of sometimes gets your foot in, the, in a door you didn't think you would be in. No, I, I definitely say it in jest, but, uh, but I'm actually curious then from that standpoint, is there, because of the, the requirement for that type of domain knowledge, is there an implication that for sake of argument, if you, now that I'm an expert, quote unquote, 
in basketball like that it can't or can or cannot translate easily to another sport or do you feel that like because some of the at least primitives are close enough just as long as you know the sport that you can actually like ba- basically jump from one sport to the other if, if need be i think there's definitely people who can jump from sport to sport and i've done a few things in other sports and i've seen some people flip sports um but i do think it's it's difficult because mostly because there's a level of communication that has to happen with a bunch of non-technical people so if you have you know most coaches have either been coaches their whole life or they played and then they became a coach and the same with front office people so you have to really find a way to like can you speak like a scout would speak where your information isn't derived from what you saw with your eyes but it's derived from what you saw with numbers so like for example i i rarely give like our gm or assistant gm a number I would never say like this guy's doing X, Y, Z from a number standpoint. It's, it's more of, I'm saying it exactly the same way the scout next to me would say it, but my information is backed by numbers because of that communication. If you were to throw me in another sport, I think I might be able to do that, but it would take, a, there's a lot of a, a big learning curve there. Um, so it helped that I had played basketball so I could easily come in and fit in from a communication standpoint. But I also, and I tell, you know, the people who started in the NBA, you know, we have a guy who started for us about two years ago. And the biggest thing I said was in meetings, just close your laptop and listen to our scouts, like, go sit with them at games, figure out how they speak so that when you go to communicate, it can be like received. And I think that a lot of people who are, who are sports junkies can do that across sports, but maybe others cannot. I think that's some really great advice. It's something that we commonly see throughout data science, which is focusing on the business problem. It's not about coming up with the coolest model. It's about what's actually going to be used and convincing the stakeholders that they should trust your analytics and your predictions. And Denny, I think you're asking about human transfer learning. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that, that's what it boils down to. Because like, what I find interesting is that, number one, exact, exactly to what Brooke called out, super sage advice. Like anytime... Like I, uh, she, you know, Brooks talked about from the standpoint of machine learning, I'll, I'll apply the same thing for BI, like back in the, back in the day, right? Which is basically, we were trying to show these cool BI models. Nobody understood what we're talking about. <laughs> so finally we explained what the output was. And then over time, they finally understood that. And so it's exactly this human transfer knowledge where, where it's basically as you're learning it, you're able to communicate and then apply that over and over again. And provided that, you know, <laughs> Like you actually know what you're talking about if you decide to go to soccer, for example, right? So, right, for sure. I think one of the things that I've tried to do here is like if if we ask our scouts to rate a player on a certain scale, all of our machine learning models will rate them on the same scale. You know, there might be some, you know, they might predict something in one scale and we we adjust it so that it, but that way it's communicable and we're not saying, you know, our scouts are rating something on a qualitative scale and then i'm over here saying on a zero to ten scale being able to give something that is is similar i think helps our executives making a decision to really digest it and use it rather than here's some neat numbers awesome well i mean i guess the only other thing i wanted to ask is like any other advice that you'd like to give especially from that perspective of sports analytics that may or may not be the same as any other analytics especially since you did call out there is the the, the non-analytics components of analytics in, in your in your sport, in your arena at least I think the thing that's just interests me the most is I think there are even a, even at across sports or across like data science industries that the I think the, the things I've found that have had the most impact or the most value or, or even just the interesting most interesting is the things that I can apply from here's something from quantitative finance or here's something that they're doing in soccer here's something they're doing in another sport because a lot of times we can just be in this bubble of basketball analytics and we stuck with the same toolkit when a lot of times if you can if you know like we talked about knowing another sport well enough if you know it well enough to say all right here's analysis they're doing and it's just it's so common in that sport but we've never thought how to use it in ours we can find a lot of those similarities and i think sometimes we we view it as oh we're doing data science and basketball and that's awesome, but it's sometimes not as dissimilar from these other places as is it make may seem. But it's a little more fun. Definitely more fun. Uh, but I mean, even the field of data science, it's just taking concepts from other fields like math, electrical engineering, computer science. So I think having that 
uh, pollination from other sports can really give you unique insights into basketball and then vice versa. So I'm going to go ahead and close out the session. Thank you so much, Alexander, for taking the time to chat with us about basketball, sports analytics, some of the open questions and what we're going to expect to see in the next one to two years. Hopefully next time there will be a coin term for the Saber metrics of basketball. Um, but thank you again so much for taking the time to chat with us today on Data Brew. Awesome. Thanks, guys.